Welcome back to the channel everyone. Your friendly neighborhood trash man Dumpster here again and today we're going to talk a little bit about the current state of horror games, both on Steam as well as on Itch. I'm going to break this video down into a few sections, but we're going to start with an overview. This is basically going to be a critique of the genre that I consume the most of, though some of what I'm saying is probably going to apply to gaming as a whole, so some of what I'm saying won't just be unique to horror. Generally speaking, horror games are a completely oversaturated market. Whether this is due to a massive influx of would-be game developers releasing their demos and half-baked projects into the wild, or if it's due to a new demand for horror games, the end result is the same. Oversaturation. Alongside the oversaturation of games, we have the problem of quality control. In the indie game development scene, bug testing seems to be increasingly uncommon, while even AAA studios release games riddled with bugs, only to patch them out as time goes on, leaving the bug testing up to the consumer. While all of this is going on, the actual quality of the assets used in games has taken a dive as well, with reused asset packs being commonplace. And aside from those more technical aspects, we can all see that the quality of storytelling has been in decline, with the same sorts of plots being recycled endlessly, and the subgenres within horror have stalled with things like the back rooms, asymmetrical co-op games, and multiplayer ghost hunting. Sure, we can mash together as many genres as possible, taking inspiration from all sorts of things, but in the end, most of what we've seen in recent years just isn't worth writing home about. With this video, I don't want to just come across as a boomer shaking his fist at the sky, because I miss the good old days of 1832 when Silent Hill 2 came out, but rather I hope that some of my points can get across and inspire some of you up-and-coming developers to take a different path. With an influx of poorly made games, we can point the finger in the direction of those making the games. Take a look at the recently added games under the horror tag on Steam, and you'll find countless up-and-comers trying to make a name for themselves with their entries into the endless abyss of the Steam catalog. We'll never really know just how many hidden gems lie within the dark heart of Steam, but for our purposes we can just point out the fact that there is indeed an influx of new people making games. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, and the more the merrier, but the issue arises when we come across unfinished projects being marketed and released as full titles. Without dunking on any projects in particular, it has become common practice for new developers to package up what would previously have been just a demo or a learning experience and sell it as a game. And again, while there's nothing inherently wrong with creating and selling a product, when it becomes as common of a practice as it is now, there's just no good way to separate the wheat from the chaff. If you head over to itch.io, a site built for indie developers to hone their skills by participating in game jams, which are basically little competitions to see who can make the best games within certain time frames with different types of themes and constraints, you'll pick up the vibe that this place was meant for this type of content. When I make my dumpster dives videos every week, I try to play new releases from Steam as well as Itch, knowing that the games on Itch are usually going to have play times of under 30 minutes, because these are games being released by amateurs while Steam used to feel like a place where fully-fledged games were marketed and sold. Absolutely. Wrong. Proof. Gone are the days of Greenlight, where games were voted on by the community to determine their eligibility to be listed in the Steam store, and any Joe Schmo can upload whatever he wants to the platform. And that's not even to mention the ridiculous amount of adult content that's found its way to our once-beloved gaming hub. <laughs> Since we can no longer determine the quality of any titles on Steam, we're simply left with the options of watching someone else's playthrough to see if we want to purchase a game, or buying and refunding the game if it doesn't meet our expectations. 
In the intro, I briefly mentioned a few quality issues that I've noticed cropping up, such as bug testing. I know I don't speak for everyone, but if I was to personally release a game with my name attached to it, I would have the integrity to publish content that has been thoroughly proofread and bug tested. I can't tell you how many times I've played horror games that are filled to the brim with typos, unplayable sections, and in many cases games that just don't work as intended, in which case the developer has to be notified before a patch can be deployed, all taking away from the experience of being able to play a game that you just paid for. When it comes to typos, it can be understandable that many games are being released by non-native English speakers who have to rely on translation tools, but surely there are ways to ask for help in the localization process, whether that be through small, part-time contracting of gig workers or just asking for help online. Again, if I was going to release a game in a different region, I would make contact with someone fluent in the language to assist with any translation issues, making sure that there aren't any mistakes in the final product. And if they somehow slip through the cracks, I would issue a patch immediately and apologize for coming off as a dumbass. You're a stupid dumbass. When it comes to assets within horror games, we can easily see the similarities in the environments that we explore. For example, there is some eerie similarity in a few random horror games that I've played within the last year, where I start the game driving a car and end up at a gas station. Take a look at this footage from Fears to Fathom Norwood Hitchhike. Compare that to this footage from a different game called Missing Hiker. Now compare these two games to another recent game called Mimic Search. And finally compare those three games to another game called Forest Ranger Services. One more example that sticks out to me is this creepy character that I first encountered in a game called Psalm 5913. Seeing this spooky man in the trailer and screenshots was basically the main driving factor that convinced me to buy the game and try it out. And the same character is actually used in the main storefront image for the game. I had a blast with the game and made a video about it and soon afterward played a different game by a different developer called April 24th. This game's trailer had an eerily similar looking character, so I was intrigued and gave it a shot. Although it is a downscaled version, the model is exactly the same. With about 15 seconds of internet sleuthing, we come to find that this is a character model that can be purchased on an asset website. Funny enough, the main character being used to market the April 24th game is made by the same asset creator. If the entire selling point of your game is going to be an asset that someone else made, you should, at the very least, have a ridiculously well-crafted story to go along with it. But, as we can see, this almost always ends up not being the case. A quick note would be wise here. There isn't anything inherently wrong with buying and using assets or asset packs in game development. In today's landscape, indie games are often made by small teams or even solo developers, so it can't be expected that everyone knows how to do every single thing. At the same time, if you're going to be releasing a project that costs money, it would make sense to me if you were to make your own assets, at least for the important aspects of the game, like the main villain or characters. Seeing the exact same monsters in games made by different people just puts a bad taste in your mouth. A decent example of this would be music loops. People that are learning how to create music will often purchase pre-made beat packs that contain drum lines, bass lines, rhythms, and things like that. It's completely normal for someone to use these sorts of things to figure out how they are composed, but making an entire project based off of other people's stuff just seems weird. 
almost as if you're assembling something and repackaging it as your own. Or in another scenario, you make stuffed animals for a living, but rather than coming up with your own designs, you buy sewing patterns from someone else. Piggybacking off of the creativity of someone else in order to create the illusion of you yourself being a creative. I could go on and on about the quality of games and dig for more examples, but if you're watching this then you've probably played a lot of the same games that I have and know what I'm talking about here, so we'll move on to the next section. When it comes to genre, horror can be broken down almost endlessly into subcategories and sub-subcategories. However, there is a strange thing happening lately where it appears that a large chunk of new releases are following a very specific formula, or rather one of a few formulas. With the popularity of the Backrooms lore came a massive amount of Backrooms exploration games. The Backrooms and other liminal spaces are all really interesting ideas, and it's been fun to see these ideas come to life in the form of games, but at what point is enough enough? We already have back rooms, escape the back rooms, inside the back rooms, Benny's back rooms, back rooms rec, back rooms break, back rooms society, back rooms media, skibbity back rooms, level unknown back rooms, furry back rooms, back rooms escape together, back rooms rebirth, project back rooms, and about a million more that have already been released or are on schedule to be released in the future. You get my point with that one. You're beating a dead horse, and I think we've explored the back rooms enough by now. If you've ever made the mistake of looking for a fun co-op horror game to play with your friends, you can find an infinite supply of the same thing remixed, remastered, reproduced, recycled, and repurposed to your heart's extent. I just hope for your sake that you have a life-consuming obsession with four-player ghost hunting or running away from spooky monsters because that's about all you're going to find when it comes to cooperative horror. A short rundown of these games would include things like Phasmophobia, Lethal Company, Demonologist, Outlast Trials, In Out, Frightened, Fear Therapy, Ghost Watchers, Forewarned, Devour, Sign of Silence, Pacify, and Labyrinthine. Someone comes up with a novel idea, and the marketplace becomes flooded immediately. The same thing happened with the Dead by Daylight asymmetrical style of gameplay, and more recently we can see the same thing happening with the Anomaly Finder game Exit 8. I guess this is why we can't have nice things. The problem that I see with all of this is very simple and it comes back around to oversaturation. You know, you actually can have too much of a good thing, and by the time you're done, you feel sick. I tend to think that streamers have a hand in all of this too, with the dramatics and acting turned up to 11. Streamers pretend to be having much more fun than anyone actually ever has in real life, drawing in large audiences and hyperinflating the popularity of games that, in reality, are mediocre at best. That about wraps up my thoughts about the current state of horror. On the one hand, it's never been better. More games are released than anyone has the time to keep up with, and some of those games are going to be amazing. But on the other hand, we have a situation in which laziness is seemingly being rewarded, where games are being listed and sold as fully-fledged products when they are, in reality, little more than buggy demos and rough drafts. The advent of early access and the removal of Steam Greenlight have negatively impacted the state of gaming in general, while other factors like copy-pasting assets, plots, and gameplay mechanics plague the horror genre in particular. What do you think about the current state of horror games? Am I missing the mark completely and just acting like a big boomer who can't handle the new way we do things? Or do you agree with any of my critique? Let me know in the comments section and Maybe some aspiring developer will read your words and take them into consideration as they start their career in the gaming industry. And as always, thanks for sticking around and listening to me blab. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more content, and check back on the channel every Wednesday for a new episode of Dumpster Dives in between my playthroughs and sporadic video essays. See you next time.